My name is Zenas Bazakis. I'm a mom, an activist, an entrepreneur, and I want to be your next Congresswoman. I never thought about running before. I was going to handle things from the business side or as an activist. But when I read that we only have about a decade left to save our planet, I couldn't just sit there. I needed to act. That's why I'm getting to work now. Strong corporate interests, lobbyists, political machines fight every day against the policies that we need to enact in Congress. Like the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, common sense gun control, campaign finance reform, criminal justice reform, student loan relief, and equal rights. All these policies will help make America more prosperous, more just, and more secure. It sounds audacious, but we have the ideas, we have the courage, and we have the political will. So will you join our movement to create a better New Jersey and a better America? Yeah! Therein are you. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Zena Spizakis running in New Jersey's 9th Congressional District against incumbent Bill Pascrell. And she was just recently endorsed by brand new Congress. She was highly recommended by fellow New Jersey and progressive Russ Yerncione. And she is here to talk about her campaign. Zena, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real honor. I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun. I'm very excited. And yeah. when we kind of first connected, we got news that a brand new Congress had endorsed you, which is really exciting. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you attended. There was like a, a brand new Congress training session or whatnot. Did you attend that? And how did that I, go? Yeah. So it was actually this. It was I just got back last night. It was this weekend. And uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, except for like maybe one, all of the candidates that they've endorsed were there from around the country. Uh, including a couple of senatorial candidates, which is new for them this year. So it's not just the House of Representatives, but you know we're gonna we're gonna change the face of uh, the Senate too. Because if we need to get anything done, we need to have both houses uh, change. But it was it was exciting. It was uh, it was uh, it was a nice. It felt it felt like this is really what the future ought to be like. It was a diverse group, lots of different backgrounds, uh, a, a number of non-native born naturalized citizens running as well. I mean, it was just it was just beautiful to behold. And everybody's coming at it from a different perspective. I'm coming at it from a you know sort of a clean energy perspective. Other other people coming at progressive values via, via mass incarceration or whatever else. But it was uh, I felt like if we put like all these people in one room or one in one house. Uh, we could actually get a lot of a lot of things done uh, as well. Uh, and the other thing that you should know about brand new Congress, none of their candidates take any corporate money. I mean, they've sworn off of it. We don't want that influence in our campaign or in our legislating. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, it was great actually. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, I saw the pictures and it was like I know this sounds corny, but it was like super heartwarming because I've been talking <laughs> to these candidates and you know it. I, I'm a I'm a fairly cynical person. I think a lot of people who follow American politics closely, it's easy to get cynical. But seeing everyone from like all different walks of life across the country kind of rise up. It really tells you that like something is happening here. And one thing that I think is is very clear about all the brand new Congress and not just brand new Congress and Justice Democrats, but anyone who's progressive who's running is there's kind of this like core, you know, um, ideology, this commitment to like Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, you know, student loan debt cancellation and whatnot. But each person, as you kind of alluded to, they're all approaching this from different angles. So for you, one thing that I really noticed is you have this really strong emphasis on uh, a Green New Deal and basically saving the planet from climate catastrophe. And in your bio, you you talk about how you kind of approached this previously from, you know, the business world. And also part of your inspiration is you have two elementary age children, which yes. is obviously going to affect their future. So talk about why climate change is kind of the issue that you're choosing to make front and center. I think it's obvious to everyone, but I think it's really nice to hear it like from you, why it matters to you. Yeah, well, you know why it matters to me. Obviously, uh, my children, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know everyone's children. Really, really, anyone being born into this world is they're not going to have the same, you know, childhood I have. I mean, I'm in the weird, uh, the weird generation where I remember what it was. I'm probably the last generation. Now I'm aging myself, right? I'm in my 40s, but I'm, <laughs> I'm the last generation to actually remember what it was like prior to the cli prior to the climate crisis. I'm in the first generation to really feel it, and I'm the only. We're in the only generation to really do anything about it. And so, you know, I was. I've been an environmental activist. Um, I, you know, I worked. 
Uh, I work in our company is a clean energy startup. Um, and I thought I was kind of doing my part until I read the UN's IPCC report last year, which um, IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and it's basically a collection of the world's best scientists telling you, well, you've got to cut your emissions by about half in the next 12 years. Otherwise, you know, run away, right? Uh, runaway greenhouse, greenhouse effect. And the thing that terrified me about that, Mike, wasn't the 12 years necessarily, is that I study climate models. I mean, I'm getting a graduate degree in energy policy and climate science. Uh, and every single climate model that I've ever looked at has completely overestimated the amount of time in which we have to react. So that 12 years to me was something more like, it, I don't know, I'm making this up five or six. It's, it's going to be a lot shorter than what they think it is. It always has been because there are things that are happening to our climate that scientists can't really predict. We've never been, we've got no way of modeling what's hap happening out there. Um, and scientists, by the very nature, are conservative. You know, they don't want to go crazy with their predictions. And so they've been completely off the mark. Things are happening faster uh, than we expected. And, you know, I, as a mother, I, I, I just, I can't, you know, I, I read that report and I so, sort of looked at my, my, I'm in a safe blue district, right? It's a D plus 16. And I'm like, what has he done on climate? Nothing. Um, in fact, he even pushed, voted a couple times to push the Keystone, Keystone pipeline forward. Um, and I would just, I understand this might not be his expertise and I don't expect him to be studying energy policy or anything like that. But, you know, part of leadership is to actually put a voice to something, even if it might be politically inconvenient. And to be quite honest, they can't, you know, no one in the House of Representatives or in, Con or in the government, frankly, can claim that they've been ignorant to this. Congress gets regular reports called national climate assessments. They've known about this. And in fact, New Jersey, where we're from, there it's expected and it's happening now. It's going to get wetter, faster, and warmer, twice, uh, twice as warm, faster than the rest of the United States. And that's happening right now. I mean, we had Superstorm Sandy. Things are flooding. I mean, it's just we, we haven't had a good snowfall since my, since my son was a baby. Um, so I just, I said, there's no way, I mean, I, this is something that's my life's work, but this is how I have to take it up to the next level because what I was doing was not moving the needle fast enough. And in order to protect our children, uh, I needed to do this. Uh, I needed to step up. So. Yeah. And I think it's really important that you give us your background because you have the expertise here and you've been looking at the data and that IPCC report, I think it really put it into perspective for a lot of people. Um, myself included, you know, to where we, we kind of we've been putting this in the back of our minds, realizing that it's a crisis, mm -hmm. but not really knowing how little time we have. And it's so important because, as you said, you know, scientists, they are by their very nature conservative. They're not going to come out with claims that are hyperbolic to get you to right. pay attention. That's not the way that they do That's, things. No. Um, so it's really important that we take things into our own hands and we really we understand the sense of urgency and really the 12 year timeline, as you said, it really isn't great. I mean, there are some there's one model that predicts that human extinction, if it's going to happen, will start by 2050. That is insane. It's, uh, you know, I think we're, we're losing, I don't know how many species a day. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not going to even start quoting about, you know, what's happening in the penguin populations or anything like that. But what, what happens with these extremes in weather is, uh, and we saw some of, some of this starting uh, in India and in the Saudi Peninsula this summer, um, plants get stressed out. They're a living organism, they get stressed out. And after a while, if you have these huge swings in weather, it weakens the plant and the plant will not be able to grow food. If the plant can't grow food, we can't feed our lifestyle, we can't feed ourselves, it starts. Food prices start skyrocketing and it becomes, it becomes an environment, the, the climate crisis is an environmental justice issue. I mean, it, it, in so many, so many ways, you know, even, even here in this country, we think, oh, it's not really going to hit our shores. Our wealth is not going to protect us. Yeah. It won't. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming for us. And, you know, there, I, I like to give the example last summer um, um, in India, there were, t uh, temperatures in part of India had reached so such high degrees, uh, that entire villages were abandoned because, uh, you know, well, the livestock was dropping dead because it was too hot. Plants were dying because after a certain temperature, I mean, your plant's going to die. Um, water dries up and there's no food and you had climate migrants. Okay. We have, we've seen hurricane was a Dorian that hit, uh, just the Bahamas, um, uh, near us. We had a climate. We had a whole ship full of climate migrants hitting Florida, and what did we do? I mean, the Trump administration, of course, sent them away. I mean, predictably. Yeah. But that's gonna. If you look at the entire planet, the equatorial regions of our planet is going to ca cause hundreds of millions of people to be displaced. They're not going to head south. They're going to head north. They're going to head north into into the U.S. into Canada. They're going to head north into Europe. 
uh, and into Russia. And you can imagine what kind of conflict you're going to see uh, when that when those people start finally. I mean, we couldn't handle the refugee crisis coming out of Syria, which some people claim had some environmental effect. You know, some sort of environmental impetus to it. Uh, I haven't seen this. I haven't seen the data yet, but uh, there there are those claims. We couldn't handle that. We can't handle what's happening at our border right now. You know, uh, you know, it's yeah. not. Um, if I, if I'm a farmer, if I'm a uh, head of a household and I can't feed my children, I'm going to migrate Absolutely. and nothing's going to get in my way. I mean, you're a parent. I get it. Um, and it's, that's not the world I want to leave my kids. Um, that's not the world any kid should really, uh, inherit. Um, and it just, it just, it's so angering. It's angering for me because, because we've known about it for such a long time. We've known about it. I mean, in, since since in my lifetime, right? And the, 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 the we've had half of the world's emissions come in the last twenty five years. That's been most of my life. We've had it's. We can stop this now. And the thing that gets me, Mike, is that we actually have the technology. We have like the vast majority of the technology we need right now to deploy it. You know, I um, I'll go back to Bill Pascrell. He actually endorsed the Green New Deal about a week after I announced and got some positive presses. Like this environmental activist is going after Pascrell, which is okay coincidence. Okay, take it as it is. He endorses it. He pays lip service to it. Activists in New Jersey ask him to come out with a statement for like at least, you know, a statement on a moratorium of new fossil fuel projects, which isn't a hard thing to do. Because, I mean, heck, we're building some, one of the largest uh, wind farms off the, sh off the coast of uh, New Jersey right now. We can replace... We can replace that energy generation. These wind farms don't take long to come up. They take they're less than a year to build these things. I mean, it's not it's not like you're building a nuclear power plant, which will take which takes like ten years. Um, we have that, but you know where where where's the leadership, right? Where's the voice to it? I mean, why does a mother who is perfectly you know is perfectly happy you know <laughs> trying to trying to get her company to like start producing, you know, clean electricity from hydrogen gas. That was our start. That's our startup. You know, why, why am I jumping into this race? Because, because of this negligence, it's criminal negligence. It is, it is, it is the biggest intergenerational human rights violation, frankly, ever. I mean, it's my children. These guys are going to be long gone out of office by the time my six year old is going to have to deal with food shortages. You know, I mean, he's and, and 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 I come from like I come from a privileged background. I am, you know, I live in a good neighborhood. I've got a good house. But what happens to the pe to folks who who, you know, who don't have my advan advantages such as ours? Frankly, advantages that are found in the United States. You go to the rest of the world and it's it's it is we will these people will die. These people will die. I can't I can't allow that. I can't allow that. Who yeah. would? Right? Who? Uh, no good person. I, I'm sorry I'm going on about this, but it gets no, really. No, you're, you're uh, absolutely. Well, that, I, I yeah. love the way that you're talking about this. And I actually want to go a little bit deeper because um, we, we oftentimes talk about climate change mitigation and adaptation, finally, um, in terms of the Green New Deal. But this is a resolution. Yeah. So there's a lot of neoliberal pro-corporate Democrats who can endorse the mm. Green New Deal, but not necessarily <laughs> explain what they think that means. Now, candidates are filling in what they mean by the Green New Deal. Um, right. But I want to talk to you because you know more about this than most people, I think, running for Congress. What does true mitigation and adaptation look like? Uh, in terms of policy, like what would you do that you think would actually suffice? Because there's people who are proposing things, but none of them either meet the deadline or they're not ambitious enough. And I think that the Green New Deal is the first right. time I'm hearing people talk about, you know, meeting the urgency, meeting that IPCC's deadline. But what do you think we need to do just if politics weren't an issue? If politics were an issue, uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, uh, just pass a moratorium on all fossil fuel, any new fossil, first, any new fossil fuel projects need to be stopped. Um, and any, um, and, th and then we start looking at the fossil fuel projects and start looking at their emissions and start, start knocking down like the co any coal fire plants need to be decommissioned. Those workers need to be trained to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, transition into a green job, whether that's building wind, turbines or uh, maintenance on those wind turbines, putting up, you know, putting up rooftop solar, whatever. Well, we can, um, 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 those are good, you know, at least in the wind industry here in New Jersey, some of these companies that have been coming in are very pro-worker. These are like, you know, good union jobs. 
uh, that should be done first of all. More, just keep it in the ground. That's the, that's that's a just a non-starter right there. Um, uh, research uh, the the I'm sorry the financial subsidies right now. The uh, depending on the study that I read, anywhere between fifteen and twenty billion dollars still go of our taxpayer money still goes to this day to fossil fuel companies as financial incentives, subsidies, tax breaks, whatever, financial incentives. Um, those need to stop. <laughs> I mean, it's a 200-year-old industry. They don't need any support. I mean, I work, so I'm paying for these guys to line their pocket and pollute the air that my children uh, are breathing. So that, that, just to give you an example, I mean, that's what it is, really. Uh, bought and paid for, right, by ExxonMobil. Um, those need to stop, and those need to be completely f- redirected into um, um, uh, either financial incentives to uh, adopt green technologies faster, whatever those may be, or if they need to be uh, deployed into research and development. That's the second thing. Third thing, and this has been used uh, with great effectiveness in other countries, and it hasn't been actually that politically controversial, is efficiency standards. What we're doing to Cal- so California has its own efficiency standards, and the Trump administration is trying to go after them for that exemption. In other words, they can't. California has been a driver in a lot of the efficiency standards around the country because if you want to sell into California, you know you got to be a good player, and that's been driving a lot of technology um, around the country. And so now the Trump administration wants to say, "No, California, you can't do that anymore." You know, they're all for states' rights. <laughs> until it comes to like energy efficiency. You can't do that anymore. Um, and they're, so they're taking them to court uh, is where I believe it is. Um, efficiency standards need to put in. And then really uh, a lot, uh, we really need to um, uh, build resiliency in some of these communities. Um, there are, uh, depending on the model that you see, as far as uh, sea level rise, uh, there are lo- uh, many parts of this country and millions will be affected by sea level rise. Those communities there's some there. It was Florida, for an example. Florida is built on limestone. You really can't build a wall around Florida and hope to keep the water out of it because limestone acts as a sponge and comes in through the geology of the state. So those communities either need to be uh, uh, something. The building codes need to change. They need to be building higher up. I don't know. Um, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit here in New Jersey. Um, it knocked out power uh, for many of these communities for quite a long time. And that's because the surges that came in, you know, they hit these substations. And these substations are not really designed to handle 15-foot, you know, tides coming in on a consistent basis. That sort of that sort of resiliency, and really it's an infrastructure spend because our infrastructure was developed for a fossil fuel economy, right? And it was developed for no climate change. Uh, and we sp- we spend like a fraction of it. We spend, I think it was two or three percent. I want to say, don't quote me. It's somewhere around there that we spend just on just on infrastructure maintenance, just to maintain our bad infrastructure, which uh, you know a lot of civil engineers will tell you needs help. China, China, China spends somewhere around eight percent of its GDP on infrastructure. They're building a green economy. Europe is building a green economy, and in fact, actually, you know, they're. Um, in a lot of their industries and in a lot of their economies, the Europeans and the Chinese, I would say, are almost 10 years ahead of where we are, or where we should be. And we should be leading this. I mean, right, right now, um, within five years, my prediction is they will be the number one manufacturer of wind turbines. They are already uh, number one in solar, um, thin solar film. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, so it's a, it's a matter of like, it's a matter of stopping the bad stuff, shifting some of those resources into the good stuff, and then helping communities adapt to what's coming because even if we stopped all emissions right now, uh, the way the physics works is that there's going to be a certain amount of warming in the atmosphere. So things are going to get worse before they get better. And I tell people, we can't really reverse it in my generation. We won't. We won't. The, the, this next election, and you can quote me on this, this next election comes down to whether we want to see the worst effects in the next uh, 30 years or if we want to slow it down enough that we see effects like in the next 500 years and allow for our children and grandchildren's generation to come up with solutions uh, to their energy needs and to really just draw it back out of the air. You know, longer term, longer term, there's a lot of things you could do with land management and forestry management that allows for natural processes to start pulling some of these, um, some of the carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, but, um, you know, if I, if I had one thing to do right now, um, you know, carte blanche, no politics involved, I would, um, and this is going to be a little controversial, but I would shut down every methane pipeline, uh, in the country. I just, and I'll tell you why, um, 
even a two percent, even a two to three percent leak in a methane pipeline, because methane as a molecule is so much more powerful at warming the planet. Uh, even a tiny little fr a fractional link from any one of these little joints anywhere on these thousands of miles of a pipeline is no better than a fossil fuel plant as far as its warming effects. And you know, people are wondering, well, why is it? Why you know, we're kind of curbing our we are kind of curbing our CO two emissions. You know, in the last three years. The uh, the GDP of the United States has completely decoupled from our uh, from our CO2 emissions. So when people tell you, oh, you know, we can't have economic growth and lower our emissions, that's bullshit because it's <laughs> it decoupled three years ago. Um, but what we're still seeing is these methane spikes in the air. And there are people like, where are these coming from? They're coming from these pipelines. And there's no way anybody can audit thousands of miles of pipeline. And if you have like the uh, uh, pipeline, you know, uh, companies, uh, the methane companies um, or uh, the natural gas pipe uh, companies, I should say, auditing themselves, it's like the chicken and, you know, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the fox watching the chicken, the chicken coop, you know. Um, anyway, but yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's those three things. Um, yeah. I, and I love the way that you simplify that. And what you focus on, um, which is important, is adaptation and mitigation. Um, because, you know, we, we can do what we can to stop climate crisis. But regardless, people, they need to realize that climate change is inevitable, a certain degree of it. It's just a matter of what we can control in terms of how yeah. bad that disaster will be. So we have to mm -hmm. arm ourselves with the capability to adapt. Now, you mentioned, you know, um, natural ways of removing the CO2 from the atmosphere. One thing that a viewer brought to my attention recently that I'm not too familiar with, yeah. and I'm not sure if you are too, is a way to um, artificially remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Is that technology <sighs> that's there yet, that's viable? What is your take so, on that? So, yeah, so yeah, I, I have read a, a little bit Bit about this technology so um so natural processes assign uh, aside in other words you know put aside the fact that we need to plant i don't know a billion trees yeah um there is so co2 i'm gonna get a little technical on you a little bit here uh co2 is a really hard thing to pull out of the atmosphere because the molecule the, that co2 molecule doesn't really react with a lot of things you know i mean it's not like i can throw a chemical out there the co2 is going to react with it and it, it draws it down. It's not really reactive, um, but there is there are some technologies uh, that are being developed, um, which base which are basically uh, there's uh, there's one company out in um, uh, the northwest uh, in the Canadian border. I forget its company. I think it's called Carbon Engineering or something like that. But they they basically have found some sort of a process. It's expensive right now uh, to pull the CO air out of the air, and 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 there there's a few companies working on this. They've all kind of got their tweaks on the same sort of basic principle as far as the chemical reaction is concerned. Um, but it's uh, it is. Um, I forget uh, the article I was reading, but I was reading an article about this, about how many of these actual plants at our current technology we need to deploy around the world to actually start making a dent. And it was in the order of tens of thousands. And these wow. plants would not be cheap to build. Um, that We need to put money into this R&D. Uh, yeah. this is not, this is not carbon capture and sequestration where like, you, you know, you get some natural gas guys saying, Oh, you know, I can still keep burning it, but I'll just carbon capture and sequester it. I'm like that, that technology where they say clean coal, clean coal is a myth. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, it is, uh, very expensive and not really viable. Uh, and it would, your electricity rates, which would, would spike if they started doing that on mass. But, um, it's, uh, this requires research and development, um, from the federal government. I mean, it's, um, it, there is something there. It okay. Just needs work. Yeah, that's so. good. Sorry to put you on the spot because I know that this is super complicated, but this is something that kind of piqued my interest because any little like thing that I could grab onto that gives me a little bit more hope, I'm trying yeah. to grab and find. So <laughs> that too. was something that was a little bit interesting to me. <laughs> but yeah, too. so you you have a really robust platform. I don't want people to think that you're just the climate change candidate, but you, you speak about this in such an amazing and just beautiful and simplistic way that helps us to understand it that I really wanted to pick your brain about this because you know so much that, you know, whenever we have a resource like you around, I, I want to I want to <laughs> capitalize on that. But with that being said, of course, I want you to talk about this campaign, the dynamics of your campaign, because you are going up against a Democrat who has co-sponsored and endorsed or whatever the Green New Deal. <laughs> right. But we all know that, you know, that was due to public yeah. pressure because he has a primary challenger. So talk a little bit about the differences between you and Bill Press. Pascrell, because this is someone who I think is obviously an establishment figure. He takes a lot of corporate money and explain why he is not the person that we need at this time when we're trying to literally save the planet. Well, you know, um, uh, so outside of, outside of like climate issues, 
um, a large part of my of my district, uh, if you look at sort of the statistics, is uninsured. Um, uh, as as far I mean, as compared to the rest of the state of New Jersey, um, m- one of my other sort of very personal issues is Medicare for all, uh, because my uh, father, who was a small business, an immigrant and a small business owner, never had medical insurance, refused to go to the doctor, died very young. Uh, I'll leave it at that. It is an issue that's personal to me. Uh, it is an issue that is personal to a lot of my constituents. I, I go out canvassing and I hear about, I mean, I just heard a story from a young woman who said her mother is going blind. Her mother, who is a truck driver, is going blind because she doesn't have good insurance. And so therefore, she's going to lose her livelihood. Medicare for all is something that this community needs, um, n- not not only because it's a very sort of polluted community uh, along the Passaic River, um, and even the air pollution here in this part of New Jersey gets an F from the, uh, from the American Lung Association. Uh, but it is something that is, I mean, aside from the moral aspect of it, you know, so that's where I come from. And if you look at, because I've got an MBA, right, I have to look at it from like the, uh, <laughs> from the economics aspect of it. It is a three and a half trillion dollar industry that is growing at roughly five to six percent a year. Okay. That is. Gr- very quickly grows to about a $50 billion industry in um, 15, 20 years. Anyway, it gets very big, very fast. One third, roughly one third of that three and a half trillion dollars is spent in ad- overhead, overhead. Okay. It is, it is, if you look at it from a purely business perspective, I'm like, that's ripe for disruption. Why is there so much fat in the system? So, and we pay, I mean, I'm not going to go into the statistics. I'm, you know, we're, we're getting sicker. We're paying more and we're getting sicker. It doesn't work. Simply, we cannot, it is unaffordable to keep our health insur- our health care system as it is right now. Completely unaffordable because it's going to grow into a monster and it's going to take an ever increasing share of our GDP, which is crazy. That's crazy. I mean, it's going it, to, it's, I mean, it's not quite the military budget yet, but you know, it's going to, it's getting, a, it's getting that big. Um, you know, I, I, it, and I personally have like a, a big sort of ethical issue with an industry whose sole motivation is profit. And the only way they can do that is to raise prices on you and deny you coverage. I had a friend of mine whose mother died of cancer because she couldn't afford one pill a month was $2,500. And her insurance company said, no, uh, we're not going to approve of that. I'm like, and she died. I mean, do they care? She died, you know, you know, it's like, oh, then people ask me, well, what about the ACA? So the ACA was a good starting point, you know, got the conversation going. But frankly, I mean, if you look at medical bankruptcies before the ACA and after the ACA, they're the same. It hasn't made a dent in medical bankruptcies. Um, And there's still 28 million people uninsured. It's just um, that there's um, obviously immigration reform is a big issue for me. I believe in a pathway to citizen uh, citizenship, whether you're here documented or undocumented. Uh, Another personal issue for me, because my my parents are immigrants um, and my parents uh, were sponsored by my uncle who uh, came here years ago. Um, um, basically was, he worked as a merchant Marine and basically jumped one of the ships that he was working on and came here. I don't know what it was, forties or fifties, uh, as an undocumented immigrant. Right. And he's, he, you know, married somebody, became a citizen, whatever. And then he sponsored my parents over. So I have this whole, you know, and, and if you look at sort of the uh, criteria that the Trump administration, it's sort of this merit based stuff, right. That they're trying to do. And I'm like, I look at my parents and I'm like, my father was a high school dropout. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think he would have made anything, you know, I mean, that's not even a criteria. I think we want immigrants. We want, we, can you imagine the, the courage it takes for somebody to come to a country where they don't know anybody, have no money and they don't know the language that takes a certain type of personality. And that's the type of personality that frankly, I think we need, um, you know, agree with me or not, but, uh, those are sort of my, my big three issues, um, climate change, uh, Medicare for all and, uh, uh, and immigration. Um, and I will say one last thing, Mike, um, I've been trying to get this into, uh, uh, to get this out a little bit more. Not every Democrat is the same. And I'm happy criticizing my own democratic party. And even, even in my run here in, in, in the state here, it's, it's a plus 16 district, but frankly, the biggest obstacles have come to me from what, uh, from the democratic party. They've denied me access to resources that I need to campaign, whatever I've had to, I've worked around it because I've, I've built and run businesses for 20 years. I can do this, whether they throw these obstacles at me or not, but it's not, 
when you walk into a voting booth and you see Democrat, you better you better be certain that they're a defending the planet and b working for you and not their corporate benefactors. Because you know, I call I call some of these guys climate delayers. They're delayers, and and people are shocked when I say, you know what? I'd rather deal with a climate denier because at least I know that they're going to deny it. But if I vote for a Democrat and he delays action, I'm voting for you, so my so I don't have to worry about my kid's future in ten years time. But what have you done? I mean, it's just it's very irritating to me. So, yeah, no, that rage is felt by millions of people across the country. I mean, there's a reason why um, independent has become the largest political party, you know, in America. And it's not a party, but just people identify more as being independent than Republicans and Democrats, because, you know, the two party duopoly isn't working because they've both largely been captured by, you know, private interests. And that's a problem. Mm-hmm. That's why we have people dying and going bankrupt because they don't have health care. That's why we haven't had action on climate change. I mean, yeah. the fossil fuel in- un- industries, they fund Republicans and Democrats. One party sim- simply just denies it. The other party delays it, as you said. And yeah. the climate <laughs> delay is perfect. I think that's the perfect moniker for them yeah. because it really is true. I mean, if, if you're not going to get in there, then just the mere fact that you acknowledge the reality of anthropogenic climate change, that's not enough. Like, we need action yesterday. And yeah. the fact oh. that people are still not even, like, willing to, you know, co-sign on the Green New Deal in Congress, yeah. in the Democratic Party, it's mind-blowing to me. And oh. for them to only do it when they get a challenger, I mean... We've wasted, we've wasted, has it been 10 months, 11 months since they, uh, since the Green New Deal? We've wasted 10 months. 10 months at this point of, of our emissions is a freaking lifetime, okay? If, I don't understand why it's not an all hands on deck thing. And quite honestly, we're, we're talking about transitioning to an economy that is decarbonized, sustainable, just for every American, regardless of wh- who they are, where they came from, or who they love. This Green New Deal, it's not one issue. It's everything. It is everything. I mean, we, it's, 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 you're dealing with so many social justice issues, health issues, I mean, energy issues infrastructure issues, technology issues. Who does America want to be in the 21st century? Do we want, because I can tell you this, this race is, is going by us. And if we don't get on board, we're going to lose. Are we going to continue to be the technological and economic powerhouse that we were in the 20th century? That's what I think we should be. And I think because we have, we have intelligent people, we have immigrants, we have you know, a lot, a large part of our, uh, our population descended from these immigrants who have this fight and this ingenuity, quite frankly, and resourcefulness in order to come to a country like this. You know, and it's it's who do we want to be as a country? That's your choice in the next election. You know, yeah. can you handle the can you handle the critical issues of the 21st century, or do you want to stay as business as usual? Because I can tell you, business as usual is not working. Yeah. Yeah. And to quote AOC, like we will pay for climate change um, regardless of if we take action or not. It's just a matter of like actually arming ourselves to deal with it through, you know, a Green New Deal and mitigation and adaptation is going to be a lot lower of a price than not doing anything, you know, about climate change. So, look, anyone who's watching this, I know is going to feel inspired. I feel so inspired by your campaign and love everything that you're saying. Tell us what we can do if we want to help you uh, donate, volunteer. Where can we go and how can we help you win? Uh, well, uh, uh, we're they might outspend us, but we're going to outorganize them, as AOC said. Uh, we are uh, actively recruiting uh, volunteers to do uh, call banking text banking, um, and also canvassing. Um, and we're also obviously, um, uh, we're, we're powered by individual donations. We don't take any corporate, uh, uh cash and that's, um, at, uh, www.zina, Z-I-N-A for Congress, uh, dot com. If folks want to, you know, maybe give me, like I tell them, you know, give me, give me, buy me a cup of coffee every month. $5 recurring donation would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. So that's my plug. <laughs> yeah. And the recurring yeah. donations are super important for those who don't know, because it allows campaigns to really predict, you know, what revenue they're going to have and how many people to hire. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot more uh, financial stability that they really need when they're going up against political behemoths like Bill Pras- Pasquale, who is raising lots and lots of money from special interests. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Including including fossil fuel. This guy took is sponsoring co-sponsoring the Green New Deal and he's taking money from the uh, Petroleum Marketers Association and the National Pro- Propane Gas Association. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure he's perfectly <laughs> serious <service>. about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, think and about this, like, like just sending money to Xena 
Who would you rather have fight for you? Bill Pasc Pasquel, I, I don't know why I keep messing up his name, or someone like Xena who is going to speak truth to power in a way that is matter-of-factly, that's bold, and that really can't be denied. Like, she knows about this, like, the back of her hand, and few people in Congress know that. Like, we have a member of Congress literally bring a snowball to the floor oh my of the God. Senate. I so imagine getting some people in there, at least a, a few, a small block, who know yeah. about climate change, who know you know what's at stake. That would make yeah. such a huge difference, even if we can't really get a majority, even in, you know, the Democratic Party. Just getting a larger block would be potentially game-changing. Yeah, I'll tell you, Mike, these progressive candidates, because they're not beholden to corporate benefactors, I mean, these people are amazing. They will tell it like it is, regardless of whether it is politically con expedient or not. We are, are in it. We, I have no choice. I'm like, the people are like, whoa, how can you say that? I'm like, you know what? If I don't say it now, I will regret it in 50 years when my grandchildren, when my grandchildren, God willing, I have some, you know, ask me, Grandma, what did you do when there was, when there was still time to do something about it? What did you do? Did you sit idly by? Did you do something? And if I don't do this for my kids, for everyone's kids, frankly, I mean, I, 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 I look at some of these children and I just start crying. You know, I'm like thinking about their future. I get very emotional, even though I come across as a very sort of <laughs> intense yeah. person. But um, yeah, it's truth to power. And not only to me, but to all progressive con candidates, quite honestly, we should be supporting all progressive candidates, not just me. So absolutely. Well, yeah. we'll leave that there. Zena, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for educating us about climate change and more importantly, fighting to take <laughs> action. That means so much. So we really we appreciate win. it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Have a good night. You too.